welcome back. Um, you cannot talk about Brazil in the region without talking about the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> and there is one, one factor that I think is permanent and has always been the major factor in Brazil's thinking about the region, the world, um, almost anything outside its borders. That's Argentina. So we're going to have Marcelo Sagier from Flaxo in Argentina is going to give us uh, some insight. Good to start us off. So, All right, thank you, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Well, um, well, I, I'm going to be addressing something else, which is, uh, is some of the implications of the um, rise of Brazil and the South American region altogether in the world stage, so to speak. And, uh, and so in terms of the uh, socio-environmental uh, implications or conditions which have been uh, kind of uh, triggered by or have been the consequence in a way of such a rising economic growth and political um, cohesion, so to speak, of, uh, of South American um, relations. So I think here that the way I try to think about this is, that, first of all, this is an, is, is an attempt for me to try to understand some of the things. So it's not that I have a, a final kind of a set idea about what's going on, but I try to identify what I think are two uh, conflicting um, trends or dynamics at play. One is the one that perhaps we're more used to, uh, to hearing about, which is the degree of, of political convergence and certain institutionalization that has taken place over the last years in terms of creating a more politically cohesive uh, South American region. And of course, I'm talking about UNASUR, uh, but I, I'm also talking about um, the extent to which a series of political um, uh, incidents which have been around the uh, attempts of coup or attempts to undermine democratic legitimacy in certain different countries in, within the region has triggered uh, political reactions or political responses from the governments which has allowed this sort of a conflict and resolution kind of a logic, which has allowed the whole uh, community, like the whole South American region, to build some sort of basis of some, maybe it's too optimistic, but something like a political, regional political community based on the defense of democracy and certain values, which I think the main point here is that there are values which transcend the political divisions or, 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 or different orientations of the governments that are members of, of UNASUR. And, and here I think it's, it's not a minor issue. I think it's uh, because in the, in the context, in the global international context, the fact that a country like Brazil and, it, and the fact that uh, a, a region is able to, for once, uh, have a common uh, voice with respect to things that happen within the region, but also increasingly with, with things that happen outside its, it, you know, the region, uh, shows that something new is happening. Uh, and the things that happened outside, of course, and I have in mind uh, the coup in Honduras, which is not a member of UNASUR. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the Malvinas, uh, Falkland Island um, uh, dispute that uh, Argentina and the UK have for many years, and which has now become a regional uh, cause for South America, and I'm, I'm thinking about the, the latest uh, of these incidents or, or issues, which is the, uh, the case of Assange, the detention of Assange, and the solidarity of, of UNASUR with the government of Ecuador. So I think there's on the one level, this is what I, I like to think as, as one level, there's something happening in terms of something of a proto-foreign policy, regional foreign policy, yeah? towards the outside and within inside for sure. There's some flexible mechanisms for conflict resolution, dialogue, and assertion of commonality, which I think it's, is quite something. But that, at the same time, coexists with, with another dimension, another layer, if you like, uh, of, uh, of regional process, of the regional process, which I think, and here's a proposal here, that is contradictory, or at least it sets some of the limits, suggests some of the tensions uh, which uh, uh, in relation to the first you know, uh, set of dynamics I just explained. And here it has to do with the, with the, 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 the role that natural resources play uh, in relation to regional integration processes. As we all know, regional, national, um, natural resources are one of the key um, uh, elements or factors which explain the fiscal solvency and economic growth of all Latin American and South American countries over the last years. 
and which has been very much uh, important for, for, for sustaining uh, um, political change, political, so, uh, social and political change in many countries, uh, which has allowed uh, po um, uh, policies in, in areas which have not, you know, social protection policies, et cetera, et cetera. And, but also, um, but also I, the impression I get, or you know, the proposition here is, is that natural resources, on the one hand, is, 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 is the, the material foundation for all these other developments at the more high-profile political level, and on the other hand, it's also its, its main source of weakness, or its main source of vulnerability. Because, and here's the idea, because in a way, this uh, sets, um, um, because natural, the, there, is no, there is no overarching uh, uh, regional policy or, or, or social consensus with respect to what to do with natural resources. So in a way, it's like a blind spot of, of, of integration. And integration is in fact taking place. And this is what I hear called uh, resource-driven integration, which is a very different set of logic at play from the other one, intergovernmental, diplomatic, high-profile, political level. And this, so there's two, two, region, two, two regional uh, processes going on. So this is, and, and I'll explain, I mean, of course, uh, uh, there are different uh, natural resources, and I'm not going to be talking about all of them. I'm going to be looking at the two in particular, which is mining or minerals and water for hydroelectrical uh, uh, power. And, uh, and I'll explain why I think they are, too, uh, they are uh, strategic or they are uh, uh, revealing in terms of the, uh, the, some of the logics that, they are, they are, that are played out in terms of regional integration. So, but the main question that I have, first of all, yeah, that these conflicts or these conflicts, natural resources, precisely because they don't, there are no social consensus, uh, legitimacy or, or, or policy frameworks within which even within countries, uh, uh, governments uh, uh, have uh, uh, been trying to use natural resources, or they, in fact they do use them, for various reasons for developmental priorities, or it's simply for just to, to extract them and just to ship them uh, in the, into the international market. And uh, the, uh, that some of the, there are many, there's a, there's a rise of social environmental conflicts in, in, in almost all countries, and that, that's a trend, that's something that's, that's, uh, that's a fact. You know. And, uh, but what I'm trying to see is whether the, these conflicts linked to natural resources have any kind of uh, uh, relationship with the ways in which uh, uh, regional building processes are taking place. And if so, what kind of relationships do they have? Let me clarify, there's a number of people now that are uh, researching the relation between uh, socio environmental conflicts and state building processes. For example, I have in mind uh, Anthony Bebington uh, or uh, Eduardo Gudinas from Uruguay who are looking in terms of, thinking in terms of new extractivism and what sort of states are emerging out of, uh, out of these conflicts and which have as key components the social uh, uh, mobilization, protests, etc in line with, with uh, companies and in line with state intervention. So out of these conflicts, new institutions and new set of policies come out as an outcome, which I think is a very interesting kind of approach to this. What I'm trying to do, or this is what I'm trying to develop conceptually and empirically, is to see the, the similar, or to pose the similar kind of questions in terms of regional building processes. So again, to think about what intersections there are uh, uh, in terms of social environmental conflicts and regionalism. And, he, okay. and, what, and what foreseeable you know, uh, trends can we see in terms of you know, the, the ambition of building a politically more cohesive South American regional bloc, which I think is very much uh, is contested, but I think there is some kind of consensus that uh, uh, even within uh, governments that have different ideological views, that it's the way forward. You know, and that the fact demonstrates, or the, the, uh, the actions demonstrate, that no one has actually tried to stay away from it, and uh, even if you don't always like you know, what takes place there. <coughs> so resource-driven integration, this is the, like the, the idea, I think undermines o o ongoing efforts to build a more cohesive political region, as I was just saying, because it exacerbates Write it twice. Existing tensions and socio-economic, uh, uh, socio-environmental conflicts, asymmetries and inequalities, exposing the lack of social and political consensus about the place of natural resources in the emerging development model, which is basically what I just said. And as a kind of working uh, definition, I have this, what I try to uh, to kind of condense what I'm trying to say. Uh, this is 
resource-driven integration, it refers to the intersecting dynamics of government policies, investments, and social conflicts in South America, which modify the terms of access and use of shared natural resources. Um, these dynamics combine patterns of imposition, resistance, negotiation, and cooptation between state, business, and social actors. But the key, the key point is that it is in that, inter, in that intersection between these forces where political space is created. And, uh, and this is political space which is, is a layer, is a dimension of regional integration. It's not something which happens on the side. I think it's integral to the logic of, of regional building uh, process. And, and, um, and whatever comes out of that, you know, we don't know yet, is path dependency. So it could, I suspect it could go the other way around and it could actually work against regional building, uh, creation of uh, you know, more cohesive regionalism rather than you know, supporting it. That's, but, okay. okay, so first of all, I think that, that logic is at play. And I think there's, there's various reasons for it. On the one hand, there are the external structural reasons for why this is happening. And in the presentations this morning, it was clearly laid out, I mean, why that's the case, which has to do with the, the location of the South American economies in the context of the global political economy, which as we know, has to, you know, is, is marked by the demand of natural resources by China, India, et cetera, et cetera which has a Im regional implication on, on South American economies, which has to do with the fact that um, uh, the trends or historical trends of, uh, of, uh, of dependence on natural resources were maintained in many places and deepened, and I'm talking here most clearly all the countries that are on the Andean side, um, and, but also uh, uh, um, there's been an expansion of economic activity uh, uh, or, or reliance on, on, on natural resources even in the other countries where they have a, a neo-developmental aspiration, and of course I'm talking about Brazil, and to some extent Brazil, Argentina. So this, uh, in a way, uh, the structural global conditions reinforce incentives uh, to, uh, um, to, uh, to, to explore and to extract natural resources in general. It's nothing new, we know that. Um, let me just show a few, just to, some revealing uh, uh, statistics, or uh, numbers rather than statistics, that Latin America, for example, in the mining sector, has become in 2010 the largest uh, area or region in the world to receive uh, uh, the overall um, FDI in exploration in mining. Okay, so this is something that's it's it's fairly new, and it's of course it re reinforces. Uh, uh, certain trends in some countries where mining has been a, an old sector of the economy, but also it has opened up uh, mining activities in other countries where it's a recent phenomenon, like Argentina, like Brazil, like Uruguay. So, so there is, there is a, a clearly a tension or, 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 or if you like, a reinforcement of, of, uh, of extractivism. There's some, okay, these are the top uh, uh, countries in terms of uh, FDI. Uh, in mining, you know, and you see quite a few of them in the world, and quite a few of them are, are Latin America or South America in particular. But okay, so that's on the one hand, I think that's what takes place in terms of the structural global uh, uh, contexts uh, which have an influence on, on extractivism or, or the, the gravitation of natural resources within South America. Okay, and that has one important implication, which is the fact that. Um, where I link it to the whole regional process, which is the fact that um, the, in the case of mining, um, the, uh, the, uh, the mining frontier has expanded. Has expanded not only because in the, there's mining uh, exploration and activities in places where it has, didn't happen to the same extent before, but also it's happening in terms of uh, new mineral deposits that are being accessed in areas, in places, uh, locations that were before banned constitutionally. And so here I mean, for example, in particular, that's it. I just heard. <laughs> okay, okay. In particular, in, in the international border areas, and I mean the Andes. I mean in, the Andes in particular. Of course, Argentina and, and, and Chile have a, a binational mining uh, uh, treaty, which is is you know the largest, if you like, or uh, it covers the largest border in the world uh, in, for mining. The same is happening more informally without an agreement in, in other borders, in other uh, international border areas, and in, in particular Ecuador and, and Peru. Uh, 
And uh, so there is, an expa there is a de facto territorial integration on the, on the, uh, along the lines of, 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 of accessing uh, uh, mining resources. So I'll speed it up now. On the other hand, the water, okay, in this case, in this case, Brazil has a leading role in providing, as it was said earlier on, in, in providing much of the financing behind the, 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 uh, the creation of an integrated uh, network uh, grid of, uh, of dams, of hydroelectrical uh, uh, dams uh, throughout South America. And this is, again, it, it brings about the, the um, what's interesting is that many of these dams, uh, which are, some of them are already built, others are in the process of, of being built or projected, um, they're located in, in basins which um, uh, um, involve more than one political jurisdiction. So they are, um, so the, de facto, there is a, a, some form of, of governance of shared natural resources in the same way as could be compared to mining in, in international border areas. So in this second case, uh, what's, uh, for example, just there are some few like, uh, very well-known examples, uh, such, such as the Madeira project. There you go, two dams which are in, in Brazil. One is in Bolivia, and another one, is in a, which is, hasn't been built yet, is in an international river which divides uh, um, the border between Brazil and Bolivia. Okay? Of course, the, 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 the Brazilian National Development Bank is the main, uh, uh, as it was already suggested, uh, source of financial support for this. Uh, there are others, like for example, the one mega project uh, in Peru, which is very controversial as well, which again connects um, uh, different regions uh, along the, uh, the, 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 the Amazon basin um, uh, production sites in this case in Peru, to, to uh, growing demand, energy demand in the southern industrial uh, sectors in, in Brazil. And so, so in that particular case, for example, in that, the governance of that uh, uh, basin or that uh, arrangement is, has some kind of a, um, a, a formalization with the signing of an agreement between Peru and, and, and Brazil, which as far as I understand has not been uh, ratified yet, but it is you know, it's part of a process of formalizing uh, this, uh, this, uh, this particular economic relation, which, in fact, the agreement so it says that 70% of the energy that's going to be produced there uh, will be exported to, to Brazil. So it is very clear what the, uh, the, uh, the, the geoeconomical logic behind this. But let me say something which is crucial to explain this second logic in terms of uh, the, 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 the water element, is that the global, again, context in this case, when it impacts, uh, in terms of mining, I said that it expanded mining activities in many areas, in international border areas. But in terms of, in terms of uh, industrial um, uh, projects uh, or industrial um, aspirations of Brazil in particular, you know, what happens is that it does introduce certain strains on the competitiveness of, industry, of, of, of manufactured goods. On the one hand, competition with China. On the other hand, the uh, the uh, the rising uh, the, the overvaluing of currency, the so-called Dutch disease, which brings you know increases the uh, the the the, the, uh, the cost of production, and um, et cetera, et cetera. But but the point here is that the drive of of regional integration in terms of energy has to do with lowering costs, uh, energy costs, at the expense of environmental and social uh, conditions. So, so there is a race to the bottom, a race to the bottom logic, which uh, has to do in this case with maintaining Brazilian uh, competitiveness globally, which again has to do with maintaining or fueling the aspiration that certain uh, sectors in the Brazilian uh, economy can fulfill their global transnationalization uh, 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 project, which is actually which is something that is happening, and. Uh, Okay. Again, as it was already mentioned, some of the, uh, the most of the, uh, the the companies, the, the engineering companies, work companies, infrastructure companies are all contracted Brazilian companies, which many people are saying uh, reveals a, a form of a form of, of collusion between some fractions of the state bureaucracy, in particular the, the development uh, uh, bank, and. Uh, with these companies. So one way to interpret this is that the BNDES and all the contracting companies which are like being uh, supported by, by the financial resources of the BNDES are in fact a form of, of an instrument of transnationalization of, 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 of the Brazilian state and economic project in South America, which of course doesn't sound very good, but, uh, but that's, you know, okay. 
Well, this is just, uh, you know, it shows the, the relation between, uh, between uh, in social environmental or mining conflicts and, and uh, with, uh, in relation to mining and in different countries by project and by community. So just to have some rough idea of, of you know, of, uh, of the scale of the, uh, of, the, um, of the process. But just to one minute, okay, one minute. Oh God. Okay. I think what's happening is that there is uh, the ways in which there are two very different cases, the mining and water ones that I just pointed out. But I think what is indeed happening is that, and I haven't had time to explore this, but the degree of, of, of tensions that uh, the, uh, the management, the governance of such resources is generating at the level of community relations, companies, states, etc., is far greater than it what it could be if there was something like a, some kind of common regional policy and institutional framework to deal with shared natural resources. And I think it's an ine inevitable thing. It will at some point happen because uh, otherwise you have competitive uh, logics in terms of, for example, a very concrete example. The water example is great, but you have other, other things like uh, lithium, for example, in the border between uh, um, uh, Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Okay, That's the new gold of, you know, of the digital industry. Okay. We need regional policies to deal with that. Yeah, but of course, regional policies which prevent competition between, between uh, you know, production in each place, but also which incorporates standards, environmental standards and procedures of consultation with mechanisms of, of enforcement, which applies not only to the companies exploring, but also to the, to, to the states which are financing this. So, I mean, we can go on for a much longer time. But I think this is one of the, the challenges, if you like, of, of, uh, of, of regionalism, uh, because otherwise it, will, it does create conditions which are very treacherous in terms of creating more tensions and in fact working against the, uh, the, the overall kind of uh, uh, ambition of having a more cohesive and inclusive and, uh, and, and, uh, and balanced uh, approach to, uh, to, uh, to integration. Okay. Yes, I mean, it's, that's a tricky one. When I think when in the case of water, I think there's a more of a, uh, if you like, I think a, a state civil society or state market alliance is more of a neo-Gramscian approach of, of, uh, of state power, international state power, which I think would explain much better the case of Brazilian leadership in its alliance with some economic sectors. I think that's more clearly the you know the approach. Uh, I don't think there is enough a compensation, or is they're taking care into account some of the uh, uh, some of the um, conflicts that are emerging, and that's where I see kind of the problem. In case of mining, it's more difficult. I'm not sure if I can uh, answer properly which theoretical framework would explain this because there doesn't seem to be uh, an easier kind of identifiable, uh, identifiable state actor in relation to integration because all, all countries are doing that and, uh, and irrespectively of which political kind of vision they have and uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, but uh, also Brazil with its Vale you know, company, all of them are. So I think it's, uh, there is perhaps even less, if you like, hegemonic uh, um, consensus with respect to mining when it comes to, to regionalism. You know, uh, uh, perhaps there is more in terms of water. I think that the Brazil as, as, as a state and with its companies and with its finance, it has more tools to kind of, kind of create the, uh, the, the consensus around this. But it's not happening to the same extent in, in terms of mining. That's, you know, as I said, I'm trying to understand this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. No, 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 I didn't compile it. I'm sorry. This is my lack of, uh, of technical skill. Uh, it's. Yeah, yeah. There is something called Okmal, which I was uh, I was hoping to explain, but I didn't realize I didn't have. It would take so long. There's, um, there's quite a few uh, civil society responses to all of this, which have uh, regionalized the uh, the the, uh, the uh, 
their actions and debates, and there's something like a, like a discourse coalition around uh, extractive industries, okay? And one of, one of these organizations, or these coalitions, is called OCMAL, that, is, that is, uh, has a website and which, com which stands for um, uh, Observatory of uh, Mining Conflicts in Latin America. I can give you the details. And they compile these, uh, these updated um, uh, charts. And, uh, and they, they, they show, I mean, uh, the, the type of conflict, uh, whether there's a, there's a judicialization of conflicts as well, what kind of, you know, of, of, of proceedings or what kind of, of rulings are taking place, whether that's changing kind of the, the legal logic of, of, uh, of, of rights, of, you know, whose rights are being defended or violated, etc. So, so there's, yeah, I think this is it. You've answered it. I think there's a huge tension there. And uh, another thing is the tension is going to get resolved just by talking about it. I think it's a tension that will be, is a, again, will be the result of the conflicts that are taking place. And, uh, and to some extent, many, of the, if you like, the, the, the rhetoric or the discourse of many of these governments uh, are just completely overflown by the conflicts. They don't, for example, in the case of, of neo-developmentalism, it, it's very clear. I mean, it's not just about jobs. It's not just about generating material conditions social inclusion through employment. You know, it's way beyond that. In fact, I think that many of the, if you like, uh, emerging kind of uh, language has to do with, with, a, with a linking nature in terms of the rights of nature, the rights of earth, you know, and, uh, and, and nature as a, as a public good, which in fact allows you or puts you in a whole different uh, situation where no extraction is, is possible. Okay, so again, th there's this tension altogether because I mean uh, the, the, the standing of many of these economies and countries depend and continue are reinforced even uh, on, on their dependence on, on natural resources. So I don't, I don't know, I, I don't think there is an easy way out. Uh, in fact, I think it's, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. But the point, that, that if, you, if you like my, the idea here is that regionalism as a, as a, as a space of integration needs to just take that as you know in the forefront you know and make that you know uh, try to to intervene politically in in these processes because that will not go away and in fact could work out the other way around could be much more detrimental i don't know if that explains your or answer, if i addressed your question but 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 again for example the, in the bolivian case i mean uh, the new constitution great but then what does it mean you know and it means whatever the uh, prevailing interpretations that result from the conflicts end up being. That's what it actually means. That's how it's legitimated on the basis of this conflict-ridden process. So I, 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 so I, I think this is similar in a way. Of, uh, and that's how the whole thing institutionally and legitimacy-wise is, is, is results out of that. That's the impression I, I get. I don't know. What's new? Well, I think there's a few things that are new. One's First of all, the degree of politi politization that uh, these conflicts have. I think, well, maybe they're not new, but, uh, but we have to, they're part of today's context anyway. So, I mean, uh, um, well, for example, the case of, as you pointed out, of Argentina and Uruguay, that dispute over the, the river. Uh, well, I think what's new is uh, the kind of leverage and space that uh, civil society groups in terms of defining what the, the, you know, the problem is and, and kind of being part of the whole political conflict and resolution. And uh, that may not be new, I'm not sure, but, uh, but I think that there's a, what's new perhaps is the sense that there's something connected to citizenship. Which is which is uh, which is different um, because it has to do with with uh, with, uh, uh, with a more of an ecological perspective on rights, uh, and I think that's 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 new, and uh, or for example the whole thing on uh, on 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 on, uh, on uh, ecological justice uh, I, that's a new that's a new ideology if you like, and uh, and and that at some point place itself in the political process. And we are just seeing a few conflicts here and there, which are, I think, recurrent. I don't see uh, international leadership or interstate leadership uh, incorporating that. In fact, I see the opposite. I see kind of the neutralization of that or, or just not addressing that and, and the conflicts overflowing in other directions. So it's going to come back for sure. But uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> I don't know.
it becomes yeah. When it, yeah, I don't think that states have the monopoly, if you like, when it comes to when it comes to uh, to this uh, to uh, to this sort of conflicts. I, I don't think so, and uh, because uh, if you like, the justifications for why certain things are done uh, are are don't convince enough people. <laughs> Let's put it that way, in a very Gramscian way, perhaps. Uh, the, they just don't convince, because there, there, there are competing expectations of, for example, many of these conflicts expose asymmetrical distributions of material benefits, very concrete, but also asymmetrical um, uh, expectations of what of cultural understandings of resources, of what resources are. And there, there I think there's a, help, there's a new kind of avenue that is opening up. I mean, it's not clear that you need to clear cut, you know, forests for, for the sake of development. I don't think there's a, there's a, I mean, those kind of assumptions about development are being very much questioned. And many of these conflicts express uh, um, the, the fact that there is no consensus around, around those issues. And I don't know how they will be resolved, but definitely they are part of the political kind of uh, equation. That's, that's, that's more or less, yeah. This is it. This is the. Um, I prefer to put it in terms of tensions rather than. Uh, I mean, if you ask me, I mean uh, personally, I think that in some countries it has uh, is regressive. Definitely, it's definitely regressive. But overall, I do think that uh, having an industrial project, it's. It's, it's a very good thing to do, you know, in order to withstand the pressures towards that regressiveness, yeah. But that's a very expensive thing to do, to have, you know. What I'm trying to show is that, yeah, that it's not, you know, the costs of maintaining industrial, uh, an industrial project, and uh, not just in Brazil, but in terms of, of, of uh, within Mercosur, some kind of integrated, uh, uh, um, you know, coordinated, uh, um, uh, production kind of a chain, etc. Um, I, I don't know if I can put a, a final, I, I think there's a, where we are in particular in relation to that, I think overall there is an increasing, uh, you know, reliance on, on, on natural resources that is unhealthy, unhealthy. I guess the question is, do you have a choice? Do you have, what's, what's the alternative? What can you do about it? I'm not so sure about that. You know, I, mean, I don't want to sound very negative about this, but I'm not so sure. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I don't want to end with such a negative tone. But uh, I don't know if what's alternative, you know, in relation to, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not so clear about that. But, uh, but I prefer, my optimistic side is, again, is trying to see these conflicts as generating opportunities for different arrangements or different, uh, which will have to, at some point, in order for things to be alternative, to, to incorporate a more local, kind of, a, 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 you know, less totalizing and ambitious notions of development. It would have to do with, with local production, local consumption, you know, some sort of a, you know, it's definitely not in a kind of planting soya bean all around or mining everything. It has, it has nothing to do with that. But I'm not sure whether the, um, the, the, the forces and the understanding of these uh, things are, you know, to a degree, uh, to a certain point where you can actually make those transitions something viable. I think the conflicts will be in the middle, and it's, it's how we, we deal with them where, you know, some possibility will, will you know, will result out of that. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Clearly, and I agree, but I think you pointed out one of the logics which explain the nature of these tensions. Again, what do you do with them, you know, which is more of the, if you like, the, 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 the who profits from that resource. And, uh, but I don't think it's the only logic. And this, so I think that if you like, the compromise or the space, the political space for compromise also uh, addresses or incorporates other logics which are already being played out. For example, in, in, uh, in some of the dams that are being built, concessions in, in Peru, 
the companies have already uh, retreated. They actually issued a, a, you know, a declaration last year, at the end of last year, saying we're leaving this place. You know, they have all the funding, they have the, the BNDES finding, they have the agreement with Peru and with Brazil, and they're leaving. And nobody's, why? Because the, the, the extent to which it has generated a lot of reaction from the people that live there, from the communities, which you know, has become very violent and there are assassinations, there's police. It's a very complicated uh, um, swamp, you know, the situation, you know, a quagmire, you know, of a, and, uh, and so the company has actually moved away. And, and it, in that case, and there are many of cases like that everywhere, but in that case, it, it's not the logic of who gets what alone. Or, or, or just that logic, is whether, I mean, what's the development kind of a, a understanding of why should there be any kind of a, you know, um, a large dam? And I'm, of course, I'm not, it's not clear cut. I'm not, I'm not, you know, being naive because on the other hand, you may say, well, you do need those resources to do something. So I, I'm, you know, I'm acknowledging that. But, uh, but it's not clear who gets what in terms, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of um, subsistence or, or, or uh, livelihoods. You know, fair enough. If you're going to sw uh, swamp, uh, you know, 10,000 hectares hectare to uh, to build a dam, so what do you do with the people there? Okay, should they be consulted or not? You know, what do you do with all the environmental liabilities that are, remain there, and in that particular case, are not paid by by Brazil, for example? The Peru, Peru will have to, Peruvian society and Peruvian state will have to take care of, of the social and environmental implications of that. So, so these are the, the tensions that are, are everywhere. And, uh, and I don't see, if you like, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the regionalism uh, uh, agenda or, or institutions and process ad dealing with all these tensions, which are coming in different directions. I mean, uh, the case of that someone mentioned in, in Bolivia, or you mentioned that uh, the road in Bolivia, it's a great example. You know, and there's lots of more coming up, I think. I mean, <laughs> that's, and I, we don't have a view on this, I, or, I think, or, or, or consensus, rather. Absolutely, because what tends to happen in each country is different, because the, the, the sub-national authorities will have different competencies depending on how the state is organized in each place. But usually, the local politics of communities involve directly the companies through corporate social responsibility, engagement problems, um, programs, but it will also engage uh, governors or, or, or municipalities in creating, uh, trying to create support for, for, uh, for mining companies to be there when they are taking that side. And, uh, and of course, that creates uh, cleavages with other companies that are not necessarily, uh, companies, sorry, um, communities that are not necessary. So there is internal uh, inter-community conflict as well. Uh, and uh, so it, it's, not, it's not that everyone in the communities are against this and everyone's in favor or, in, you know, no, it, it, it's, it's much more complicated than that. It's, uh, so yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, sometimes um, but there's more than one company with different views about, about this. And, uh, but what I don't see happening, and also in, this, in national settings in this case, I don't see mechanisms for uh, aggregating debates, consensus, policies, participatory ways of you know, creating consensus for this. I don't see that. There's something new now in Bolivia that was just uh, uh, announced uh, just a couple of months ago. There is an attempt, because of the conflict that you pointed out, uh, to have some kind of a, a, a institutionalized consultation process to, you know, to allow to create the conditions, political conditions, and uh, the, the objectives as to what to do when they, there is some kind of infrastructure work which needs to be kind of uh, uh, put under consideration. And, uh, so there's a lot of conflict management in, uh, involved, yeah, definitely. With that, 